by the rivers of Babylon. Yeah, we sat down and we cried when we remembered Jerusalem. We were sick, Lord, near to dying. Oh, Shalom, shalom, family. Welcome once again to another um, Tanakh review. My name is Uziah Lewi, one of the teachers of Congregation Beit Da'akak Mabina, located in the Red Hook section of Brooklyn, New York. Our address is 382 Hamilton Avenue, and um, I'm glad to have you here once again. Early Shabbat Shalom to everyone out there. Hoping that everyone has had a great week, and I pray that the Most High God will continue to bless each and every one of us, even on um, the Holy Shabbat day on and every day beyond. Also, um, first and foremost, giving glory to the Most High King of the universe for all that he does for us, acknowledging that he is God and God alone, and besides him there is no other. Also, um, just briefly acknowledging um, the Yehuda family, the... Um, for their loss, even um, Sister Tahora, Yehuda, um, praying that the Most High God be with, with all her, her family, her brothers, Yahoshua, Itamar, Mat Masatiel, all of the brothers and the sisters, um, her children, praying that the Most High God will strengthen them and be with them even in this the time of their loss. May the Most High God bless them and... and um, you know, that her name be for, for a blessing, you know, for the rest of of eternity as we um, speak about her, that it may be in a pleasant way. So I pray that the Most High God will strengthen the, the families of Israel, all of those who are affected by loss, and by any, if you might have anyone that's sick within your family, we pray that the Most High God will heal them and cause them to be strong. Um, so we, we give glory to the Most High God once again, and we're going to move straight ahead, and we're going to hear from uh, one of my teachers, um, even a mentor of mine, even Nasik Zerishad Ben Yehuda. How are you, Nasik? Uh, right. Your mic wasn't on. Okay. You can hear me now? I can hear you now. Okay. All right, first of all, my condolences to the family that lost a, a loved one. May God uh, the Creator comfort them and all other mourners of Zion. Um, first of all, I'd like to give praise to the Supreme John of the Universe, God of my forefathers, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob. And due respect to the platform I'm on, the DCB channel platform, uh, spiritual leader, Chief uh, Prince Jerry Irvin Yasaska, and also uh, the host, Chief Uza Alvin and Lewi, and to the princes, Chief Rabinet, Kohanine, Maureen, brothers and sisters, visitors, I greet you in the tongue of forefathers, Shalom Aleichem, and the early Shabbat Shalom. Um, <clears throat> this, this week I'll be trying to cover uh, two portions of the Psalms. I'll be de dealing with Psalms 11 and Psalms 45, respectively, for the Sidro of uh, Wayera, as most people say, Fariera, and Chaya Sara. And that should put, bring me up um, pretty much on in my normal. Uh, scheduling segment. Um, <clears throat> first off, I like to deal, uh, say, Adonai Saptadi Takopiya Gichi Atheaka, O Lord, open down my lips and my mouth shall declare that praise. And we we'll just look at uh, the Sidra Wayera. And what's interesting um, in, the, in, the, in the Sidra Wayera is that it says, and the Lord appeared unto him by the terebims of Mamre as he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. We left off where Abraham has got circumcised and he circumcised his whole household. And the creator had made a covenant with them at that particular time. <clears throat> um, now, it is, this is unusual that the creator appear without being requested, you know, for Abraham. It appeared to him and without being requested for, and that's the only time that the creator appears and there's no message at the beginning of the appearance. Usually when the creator will appear, he'll start off speaking right away. 
But in this particular sidra is one of those mysteries that the creator appear. And as we go through the sidra, I'm going to be very, very brief in this and then focus a little bit more on uh, Kaya Sarah, which is pretty much a long, um, even though it's, it seems short, it's pretty much a lot of um, <clears throat> interesting points to be uh, elaborated on amongst the various schools of thought. Um, but what we find interesting, I'm going to give you just an overview of that. And excuse me, guys, again, I, I guess I'll get around and get another one. I got another set, but they're not as good. Um, it starts off with Abraham after it says he had to entertain three angels in this particular era. And Abraham intercedes, Abraham intercedes for the people of Sodom. And we know also, you know, his name was changed from the last Sidra. And the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And it goes into God remember Abraham and saves Lot. And Lot daughters bear him a son. Abimelech takes and restores Sarah to Abraham. And then the 21st verse, it goes on about the birth of Isaac. <clears throat> then Hagar and Ishmael cast out. Abimelech, a covenant with Abraham. Then the final part of this thing is Dakira, which is Abraham proves his faith and obedience with the near sacrifice of Isaac. So <clears throat> um, one of the things Abraham shows hospitality to the uh, three angels that appear for him in the heat of the day. And, you know, they could prophesy, you know, uh, told him that Sarah will have a child, you know, in the season and uh, at that particular time in the following year. All right. And we know also that when they, Abraham showed the hospitality, that's why we usually say the hospitality of Abraham, which mainly is an Eastern custom, you know, which is far uh, removed from most Western societies, that uh, he, he uh, gave him a lavish banquet in the heat of the day and spurred a moment, and he served as the host um, physically. And he, he even tried to employ his wife in on uh, being a host as well. What we find also is that when they got ready to leave, and some interesting things too, you know, just um, being taken place. But um, just to be brief and to move on, one of the things we look at in, in this 18th chapter, 16th verse, the men rose up from thence and looked to us, Sodom and, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. This is a custom supposed to accompany you know, guess a certain distance when they leave your property for safety and concern. And um, so Abraham did, did this. So a lot of customs is picked up from what we read in the book of uh, what era and, you know, and he appeared. And then it said, and the Lord said in the 17th verse, shall I hide from Abraham that which I'm, I'm doing, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. So, for I have known him to the end that he may command his children and his household after him that they may keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice to the end that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. So, right then we find in this, um, in this particular portion that the creator has a, a real plan uh, for Abraham to share some information. If the, unlike most uh, 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 mythology that prior to this time, the creator wanted to reveal certain things to a man such as Abraham, who he sent on a mission that supposed to be where all nations of the earth are supposed to be blessed. And this is a serious mission because if all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed by you, then you share a certain responsibility. As being one of the descendants of Abraham, you share a responsibility of concern for the world. So the creator decided to bring this in this, and there's a reason he said he qualified for that because as long as he alive, he gonna say, this gonna be the course of action of morality and the standard for everyone in my household. Sometimes we can't, um, unfortunately in some societies, in some places, Today, we cannot um, speak for everyone in our household, but 
Abraham was able to speak for everyone within his household and make sure they comply with the rules and regulations of the household. In a country, we have problems where people are obeying just some simple laws is not running a red light. The stop at a stop sign. Uh, and these are the you know, general laws of the land. So Abraham, if the nation is going to be blessed to Abraham, then therefore he should be concerned what happens to anyone in the nation or, or any, all kind of mankind, any mankind for that matter. So when we look further into this um, particular area, and it's in the 20th verse of the 18th chapter, and the Lord said, verily, the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and verily, their sin is exceedingly grievous. I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is coming to me. And if not, I will know. And the men turned from thence and went toward Sodom, but Abram stood yet up before the Lord. And Abram drew near and said, Will thou indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure, there are 50 righteous within the city. Will thou indeed sweep away and not forgive the place for the 50 righteous that are therein? That be far from thee to do after this matter, to slay the righteous with the wicked, that so the righteous should be as the wicked. That be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do justly? And the Lord said, if, they, if I find 50, if, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will give all the place for their sake. Now, <clears throat> we know how the story went, so I'm not going to go through the whole story, but he pleased and he judged at the same time. He judged at the creator at the same time. The creator showing impartiality in the beginning in this particular area where most people in most societies think that God is so far removed from the world that he's not interested in what goes on in the world. The creator saying the cry had got already up to him and he comes down. The creator don't need to be able to get close to see the situation. So it's there to teach us a certain lesson that though I'm at a distance, sometimes when you be a judge of a particular situation, you got to distance yourself from the litigants and, you know, the complainer and, you know, and everybody else, you know, that's, that's before you. You distance yourself so you could try to be impartial because if you're too close to the individual, you're subject to be partial. Now, we know the creator is not influenced like that, but it's a lesson to be taught because if the creator knows the end of a thing before it exists, then why is it that the cries went up that he decided to come down? Did he understand the cries? Was he not able to see when he created light? And also in Isaiah, say, he, you know, you know, he created darkness. And then when you read later on that he dwelt in thick darkness. So what will escape him? So this is a lesson for Abraham and a lesson for us for all times. So when we look further into the, 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 the story that when he come down and said, look, I know what they said, but I'm showing that sometimes people might exaggerate. Some people might stretch certain things. Some people, you know, may, uh, may not give a clear reconnaissance of the individual. So I'm not looking only at your complaint, which you lodge against the individual, but I also want to look at the individual who the complaint is about. Let's see if all that's there as well, because <clears throat> you only hear the complaint coming from one side, and then you call another individual in who's being complained against, who the complaint is lodged against. So the creator comes down and said to see, you know, if not, because the complaint is bad, it's negative. And if it's negative, that means destruction is coming. But the creator shows a certain type of mercy to say, look, I got to come down close up before the verdict is cast. I got to really examine the situation. So when we look at it that, to, that, to that level, to that degree, 
then we realized immediately that we should be likewise when people come before us. But Abraham, if the cries went up to God, don't you know Abraham had to know what was going on in Sodom? When Lot chose Sodom, the very next word they say, and it was, you know, as in reference to Sodom, is the character of the wicked city. That wicked people of Sodom was very seemingly wicked. So when Lot separated from Abraham, and the very next thing it mentioned when it mentioned Sodom is about how wicked the place was. So we know that the place was that wicked at that particular time. You know, um, then it was not a foreign thing to hear about that. And then Abraham was one of the most influential patriots that we had out of the three, uh, more influential than Isaac and Jacob himself. But sometimes his influence only goes so far. But let's go further. But he prayed for that city. And we know the final analysis, final analysis and, um, thing, what he said, um, that um, and when it gets down to the 30, uh, well, I guess in the middle of the 32nd um, verse, and, and peradventure, 10 shall be found there. And the Lord, which is, and he said, the Lord, I will not destroy it for 10's sake. And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left all speaking to Abraham and Abraham returned unto his place. 10 people out of five cities, uh, that's, that, that's only two per city. And the creator said he left off for that. So we know eventually the Sodom was destroyed. And most people assume Sodom was destroyed for that um, their sexuality, the immorality of sexuality. We know that the other nations around the world, Canaan, as we read later on, had immoral sexual practices. We know when we was in Egypt, they had sexual and moral immoral practices. So it was not just the immorality of sex, sexual immorality that was involved, but wickedness of every extent that was being um, held as a standard of living in, the, in, the, in the, those cities. Sodom and Gomorrah was actually twin cities. So, you know, today they just say, uh, you know, persons guilty of sodomy based on what instance that's cited in the, in, 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 in the, pro, in the area with life. And we know that after that, that, um, that Lot finds up um, being saved. He loses his wife. He goes into the, um, the mountains and um, have um, his two daughters, had children by his two daughters. Um, and they became great nations. One of, one of the children is called Moab, which means from my father. And the other one, Ben-Ami, which is son of my people. And those were the, the offspring. Those nations was the children of the Moabites and the children of the Ammonites. And we know that Ruth, which the book of Ruth is a tribute to, um, uh, that, that speaks about, which means a friend, she's out the line of the Moabites. So um, then after that, um, you find out Sarah's adopted a second time in her life. You know, and what's, what's interesting when we talk about Sarah being adopted a second time in her life, first time amongst the Egyptians, uh, the, the, the king of the, uh, Egypt, <clears throat> all he accused was Abraham, you know, for what he did to him. When Abraham said, you know, asked to say that uh, you are my sister. And, you know, and sort of go well with me for your sake. But you got to think of some of the moral principles about you're going to put somebody in danger to save your life. Your morals meant more than her morals. I mean, this shows that Abraham, though he was a great man, he was a human man and had human fears. And also, you know, there's a lot of discussions that could go on about what's good about that. Two things, two mistakes, you know, in the beginning of his journey that you look at and, and this bears a lot of discussion. One, you enter a land of uh, Canaan and you was promised success, but yet because there's a world first famine mentioned at this book and, and at that time, you go to Egypt without saying, the Lord, can you do something for me? 
right here. And yet you put somebody else in danger going to Egypt. And while going because of the famine, you didn't pray to God. And when you in there, you didn't pray for God. But God still looked out for you because he made a promise to you, you know, of success. So there's a lot of things to be discussed in that area there. But here's that that Egyptian uh, king uh, uh, pushed Sarah out um, of the, you know, I mean, well, not Sarah, but basically, you know, escorted Abraham out, you know, all the way to the borders and made sure because he was very fearful for his life. So he only uh, addressed Abraham for what the sin that he did to him, but Abraham never answered. Now we get to this particular portion where Abimelech has um, Sarah as a, as a wife. He took her. <clears throat> and but the difference is when Abimelech takes her, he did his investigation. He asked, uh, you know, I mean, you know, Abraham. And Abraham told him that he was his sister and brother. And Sarah said the same thing. You didn't read where Sarah said anything to the, the Egyptian um, king at all. And, you know, so you only could speculate. Abraham had to say something um, because the king said of in, in uh, Egypt that the sin you did to me and not addressing her. But Abimelech, in his case, he points out that um, in a dream, when the creator came to a dream and, and a dream with him, and this is, for, matter of fact, the first time you read about a dream in the book was with Abimelech, that um, he um, said, you know, well, you slay a righteous nation in a dream. You know what I mean? He, he took an innocent of his heart because he asked and investigated, and they both said, yeah, we're family, we're related as sister and brother. And he wanted to make her as a queen and not because um, he just strictly lusted at her. And this is a woman that's up there, you know, close to 90, if we go by any chronological order. Because then, within the 21st chapter, they talk about the birth of Isaac. Uh, and, um, and it goes on to say, in the you know, 21st chapter, second verse, and Sarah conceived and bore Abram a son in his old age at the set time in which God has spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son, Isaac, when he was eight days old. All right. So <clears throat> we realized that he's the first one that we read about in the book that actually was circumcised on the eighth day of his birth. So it's a lot of first things about Genesis. That's why I love, you know, going over it from time to time. And, so, you know, you can never bring out everything that you might want to say or able to say on Genesis. Then uh, we go uh, further on and we talk about Hagar and Ishmael being cast out um, in this particular portion. And then uh, we know Abraham. Uh, we, uh, I like to read this, for this just a little bit, not elaborate too much on it. And the children grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had born unto Abraham, making sport. Wherefore he said unto Abraham, wherefore she said unto Abraham, cast out this bondswoman and her son, for the son of this bondswoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. And the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight on account of his son. Not the woman in kind of his son. And God said to Abraham, let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondswoman and all that Sarah with uh, and all that Sarah said unto thee, hearken unto her voice, for an Isaac shall see be called to thee. And also of the son of the bondswoman, I will make a nation because he is thy seed. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it unto Hagar, putting it on her shoulder and the child and sent her away. And she departed and strayed and strayed in the wilderness of Beersheba. All right. And we know how the story goes from there, you know, because um, <clears throat> 
the boys almost, you know, died behind that. But can you imagine that a father, a man who just hosted some, and this is all in the Sidra of Wa'ara, where he hosted some strangers at that particular time. And then he going to send his son, who he care about, and the woman, his mother, you know, out with just food, a bread, with bread and a bottle of water on their back, like a knapsack, so to speak, instead of any kind of beast of burden to carry enough for a journey and to go where and send them where? Those are some operative questions. You sending them out, but you ain't saying where you sending them. It's not discussed where they're going to go. So this is something to discuss even deeper. Some of the psychological issues that could, you know, transpire even among some of the great men in our way of life. And then we go um, uh, further and we skip on down to the uh, 22nd chapter, which is um, the famous Akira. And it came to pass after these things that the Lord did prove Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, here am I. And he said, take now thy son, thy only son whom thou lovest, even Isaac, and get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee, uh, uh, tell, you know, I will tell thee of. Uh, and Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son. And he cleaved the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto the young man, Buy ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder. Uh, so we know what happens there. <clears throat> you know, we'll skip on down when he got ready to offer up the Isaac that the, the very last thing I like to bring out in this particular portion is that And the ninth, uh, and the ninth verse, but yeah, in the tenth verse, I start jumping the tenth verse when when I was buying. Now, if we go by any um, chronological age, given for information is given in Torah, we figure I is about thirty-seven at this particular time. In the tenth verse of the twenty-second chapter, and God and Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son, and the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. And he said, lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou art a God-fearing man, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looking behold behind him. A ram caught in the thickest by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering instead of his son. Now, that's an um, interesting thing to discuss. And there's so much people always discuss it, that he prayed for Sodom, some wicked people. I Earlier when he was told, those that follow the scriptures directly, you know, um, chronologically, when he was told that he was going to have a son to, uh, to his wife Sarah, he even pleaded for a moment for Ishmael. But the way he sent him off, it seemed like, wow, that's a strange feeling. You just pleaded about that Ishmael might live and you just gave him bread and water and you hosted a big thing for us, some um, beings that, you know, which, which we find out later on is called angels. Um, they, they, they like men to Abraham, but there was actually angels we find out later on when he got to Sodom and Gomorrah. <clears throat> and then here it is that Isaac himself, you know, when I mean, you talk about Isaac himself, you don't plead at all. You start off and it takes you two days completed. By the third day, you still see the spot where you got to offer him up way up. So why God gave him so much time to consider 
why he didn't say anything in the two days period before he got there on the third day. Like, um, is this really what I must do? Is there any way other than this? So that bears a lot of discussion. And then to seal it more so, we find out then that an angel called from heaven, can an angel move in a blink of an eye, appear here and appear there, but yet he calls out from heaven? That means he, I'm a, I, I can't get there fast enough. So what's going on in Abraham's mind? That an angel that's in heaven that could be able to, should be able to get to where they want, you know, and, and at the speed of thought, so to speak. That he got to call out because the voice might travel faster than he could go. They tell Abraham, and then two things said, don't touch him, don't slay the lad, don't hurt him. Those things, why would you say too? If they don't touch him, that should be good enough. Stop, that should be good enough. So those are areas to be discussed further amongst you know, the various teachers. You know, why those two phrases are being used like that? So, um, and the dynamics of it is, this the last time, the last time, once God told Abraham to offer up his son, you don't read where God himself ever spoke to Abraham anymore in the scriptures. So that's something to consider. The angels called out, not God. So those are very, very interesting points. I always find really, really, you know what I mean, you know, intriguing and make you really look within yourself as an individual about what's going on. So now I'm just going to read the psalm that goes on with that particular portion, which is uh, Psalm 11, which is the only 11 verses. I mean, seven verses, rather. Psalm 11, 11 verses that goes along with this particular portion. And then I'll go back to Kaya Sarah and then finish off with the psalm there. So I know I'm doing double, so just bear with me. Um, next week I should be on point where just doing one and I won't be as, uh, as talkative as, as uh, when the next time it comes around. So... Going to the book of Psalms. Uh, let me see. The 11th Psalm. And there's only seven verses in the 11th Psalm. So let's see how, how it matches up. Do we get anything related to this particular portion of our era? And one of the most important things in my era is that though it means the Lord appeared, everybody else seeing like they be, can't see certain things until the last minute. You know, we find out that uh, the Lord appeared, but there's no real interaction with that. When we read, read about, um, you know, the, 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 the angels, you know what I mean? You know, uh, you know I mean, the three men appearing and, and at the door, Abraham didn't notice them at first, that they stood in the door, but then they had to look and see. Then we know that uh, also, that um, when they, you know, if, you know, we talk about the 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 well. Before we talk about the the, the um, yeah, we talk about the well when Ishmael is out there, you know, and his, his mother's out there, and Ishmael's almost left for dead, you know, the well appeared before him. So there's a lot of things to see. Abraham had to, had to travel two days, and on the third day, something he finally see. So it's strange to say that. If everything is appearing, how come people don't see right away within that particular story of what era, which it's all right there, but sometimes you got to open your eyes to see. So in the um, 11th Psalm, the first verse, um, and it's a Psalm uh, tribute uh, written by David. So you can start off there, the 11th, 11, 7. I mean, 11, number one. We're in the book of Psalms, chapter 11. Yes. Starting from verse 1. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It reads, For the leader, a psalm of Dawi, of David. Right. In Yehovah have I taken refuge. How say ye to my soul, flee thou to your mountain, ye birds. For lo, the wicked bend the bow. They have made ready their arrow upon the string, that they may shoot in darkness at the upright in heart. When the foundations are destroyed, what have the righteous wrought? Jehovah is in his holy temple. 
Yehovah, his throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. Hold right there, hold right there. So this gives you a little bit of reference to Sodom stories in, within the portion of what era. You know, it focuses more on that. And when we look at that more so in that sense that we know Lot had to go to the mountains, though he didn't want to go to the mountains. But uh, one, of the, uh, uh, one of the interesting things, you know, even though it's written like that, you know, David, you know, said, flee thou to, the, to your mountain, ye birds. You know, we know Lot start off with four, but wind up with three, making it there. And, you know, to the mountains. And uh, we know that, um, you know, when, when they talk about the God, you know, the creative judges, you know, what had the right to work, the Lord, the Lord is in his holy temple, and the Lord, the Lord, his throne is in heaven. His eyes behold the eyelids, but um, try the children of men. Uh, and, then, and then it goes on, and the Lord tried the righteous, but the wicked, and him that loveth violence, his soul hated. So that means it was a court case dealing with Sodom and Gomorrah. So much so that Sodom had an advocate out of Abraham in that sense. And so you see the relationship between that and my era in that particular episode of Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, what is um, really um, interesting here is that David looking at it and see his life as placed within the story. So when we read the Psalms, we should be able to see some of our own lives and somewhere in the Psalms, how we reflect and how can we identify with things that's going on in our life from what this great psalmist had wrote and other psalmists have wrote. Out of the 150 Psalms, about 70 of them is attributed to David and the rest is, you know, various sources or, you know, for other sources. So now um, we can pick it up from the sixth verse. Yes. No, I, that's the rest of I. Verse 6 reads, Upon the wicked he will cause to rain coals, fire and brimstone and burning wind shall the portion of their cup, shall uh -huh. be the portion of their cup. For Jehovah is righteous, he loveth righteousness, the upright shall behold his face. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That finished that particular portion. That was a short psalm. So I'm just going to cover on um, Kaya Sarah, and that should bring me up to uh, speed there. So um, I just want to, and then we are uh, touch on Psalm 45 with Kaya um, Sarah, which is a little bit longer uh, psalm, you know, and Kaya Sarah. But um, about 18 verses, believe me, in Kaya Sarah. So in Kaya Sarah, it starts at the 23rd chapter of. Uh, Genesis 1 and goes to 2518. Uh, so we just left off where Abraham almost sacrificing his son Isaac. And then now, if we think of any chronological order, you know, this is one of the things that says, and the life of Sarah was 107 and 20 years. <clears throat> These were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died in Kiryat Abba, the same as Hebron, which means binding, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. All right. And the Hebrew says, uh, um, let's, uh, let's appear, you know, which means to, uh, to tell a story or eulogize. And what's interesting is that the word, you know, Kai Sarah itself, all right, and as everybody rightly understands, that it talks about the life of Sarah, but, you know, and it, but it gives, a death, you know, it talks about more about her death and her funeral arrangement of Sarah. So now, where does the life of Sarah lies at? Is in Abraham eulogizing. This is the first time you read about a eulogy being, uh, you know, uh, for anybody. Now, Sarah, the first matriarch, this is the first time you read an age of a woman given at the time of her death. It's the first time, and Sarah, my mother Sarah, is the first person that was defined in the scriptures as being beautiful. Ain't that something? You know, we know Eve, our mother Kaiwa, Eve, she, she was a beautiful woman because God made her. But the first beautiful woman that's mentioned and described in, in scriptures is Sarah. The first woman, uh, first burial that we're gonna read about in scripture. Now we can assume, assume that other people was buried in the past, 
But the first mention of a burial was for this great woman. And then not only that, what we have here is that her life story was important because you don't have, you have people where we read something about, like say Abraham's life, but we don't read much about Sarah's life, but yet her life story had to be told by the man who life we read about the most. So, and then played a, a, a pivoted role in his life. So those are some of the, um, the great things to look at in Kaye Sarah. And then when we look at Kaye Sarah as, itself, um, and it says that he can't, you know, the word, you know, um, matter of fact, let me just go to that chapter just for a moment. In Genesis, just to open your eyes. And, um, which is um, 23rd. It said, Why you Kaye Sarah? I want to skip all the way down past this here. Uh, where where it says uh, uh, Abraham, uh, which is as part of uh, the second verse, uh, which where it says uh, uh, Abraham disappear. Abraham least uh, excuse me, least for la Sara where leak kota where leak kota. Now when leak kota, both prayers to mean weep, weeping or crying. All right. But he went to talk about it first. And then what's interesting is that the word, you know what I mean, um, for um, where basically uh, 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 bokeh, the, 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 what we have is the cough is very small, small letter. So, and when we look at that, you know, those that, you know, might be studying the Hebrew, and we notice that that letter is written small. So what is he talking about that he can eulogize? Usually when you go to a funeral, People cry and weep, and then they get themselves together to decide to talk about and eulogize another individual. And usually, usually the eulogy is for the family members, and I mean, you know, a testimony more so for the family members, as you know, as opposed to anybody else that might be in the crowd. So here you have a family member, a husband more, you know, uh, you know. A, a, a more, uh, you know, that's actually said, I'm gonna, I need to talk about my wife. And I'm talking about my wife in the presence of strangers. You know, I'm speaking to my, about concerning my wife and how great she was to the Hittites. What I'm saying and concerning my wife is that she was so great that you don't know how great this woman was. I mean, you might know how great I am. You might know we was wealthy. You might know that we was traveling and everything like that. You might know she was beautiful. You, you, you might have had a little idea that, you know, even the king of Egypt wanted her. King of Abimelech, want, you know what I mean, wanted her one time, you know what I mean, some years back. You know, Abimelech, you know, was interested in her. So she's a beautiful looking woman and she died looking beautiful because the way it says, you know, a hundred and, uh, you know, then it says, and 20 and seven, you know, the, the sages got a lot of, you know, talk on that, which I'm not going to go into it right now, um, about the difference of the, um, the numbers and the way it's arranged. But that you explain it now, how that it's not just my loss that this woman is going, but it's going to be impacting you as well. That's how great this woman was, that it, it, it hurts me, yes. And that's why I got to tell you that how great she is and how much she meant not only to me, but how much she really meant to you as well. So this is almost like not even just a sales pitch, but actually staying, stating this woman has such a great status that she's, the, 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 um, you know, the greater you are, the more meek you should be. So, and so Abraham, when you think about the status, about how much she meant and how much of a role she played in life, is little, very little that he had to mourn for. And then it says he went to talk about Sarah, but then he mourned. 
So when it says that he talked about Sarah, you could view it from this perspective here that he actually was say, I need to give some 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 um some eulogy concerning how great this woman was to everybody. But the sad part, how much it affect me, I'm gonna keep to myself because her name is mentioned with the eulogy, but it's not mentioned with the crying. So I need to let you know who I'm talking about, but this grief, I'm gonna keep it inside me. Seems similar to somebody later on in the history. And she's the only, uh, uh, the only um, woman that has a Sidra named after her. Only female. We got Sidra's named after men. You know, Allah, Korah. You know, you got different Sidra's named after different people. But, uh, you know, I mean, but um, you don't have, you know, but this the only Sidra named after the female. All right. And we know the haggle goes on. So we, um, I'm not going to go deep into the haggle um, because uh, one of the things that's to be brief in that is that Abraham asked about an audience with the children had to buy a cave. He never asked concerning the field. But the guy brought up about the field. But Abraham was only interested in the cave and not the field. And therefore, while he was interested in the cave and not the field, to show you that sometimes guys uh, was not sincere and they be dealing in, in, in bargaining uh, with one another. Um, so I'm gonna move on from there. And I like to focus on this portion here where he talks about looking for a wife for Isaac, which is uh, I find very interesting in this sense. Because it's very rare that this happens in scripture. All right, so in the 24th um, chapter, it's focused on that uh, in the beginning, and Abraham was old, well stricken in your age. And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said unto his servant, the elder of his house, that rule over all that he had, put, I pray thee, thy hand under the, my thigh. And I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that thou shalt not take a wife for my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell, but thou shalt go unto my country and to my kindreds and take a wife for my son, even Isaac. Uh, and so, so now, one, questions. Uh, and this one I'm gonna just focus on pretty much and you know, and then go to the song. The questions is that why is it that he got to send the servant and not Isaac? He was told to leave, not Isaac. <clears throat> Isaac is up in age now. <clears throat> and why are you going to get a, a wife for your son, you know, a bigger people when you distance yourself from there? Uh, <clears throat> and then you left there on a mission where people on that side was idol worshipers and you got idol worshipers in the land of Canaan. So what's the difference between the idol worshipers? You know, it's the moral constitution that exists between that side of the, uh, where you came from as opposed to the side where you at. And then when you leave the wife, beginning the wife for your son, who's a grown man now, pretty much, because we know he got married at the age of 40, so it's given there then why is it at this particular time that you having the servant go get the wife instead of send the son? And then not only that, uh, why you had the servant square, don't let Isaac marry a Canaanite. Why not make Isaac square, do not marry a Canaanite? Because he the one that you're concerned about marrying outside. The like servant can marry whoever he wants. But Isaac could not marry a Canaanite, the people of the land which he dwelt. So if that's your concern, why not tell Isaac that? And then how's your relationship with Isaac after the situation of the Akira and the burial? So those are those are some things I like I like to point out in that area there. And then um, as we go further down <clears throat> the line, uh and you're talking about, you know, um, and it's, it's a lot of little jewels, like, you know, that's in here. But uh, but the servant, he was, he was smart when he would swear, he says, 
Um, but, uh, you know, and, um, and it says, but thou shalt go unto my country and, to my, uh, and take a wife from son. You can know, that's okay. And fifth verse, it said, and the servant said unto him, peradventure the woman will not be willing to follow me unto this, his, this land. Must I need bring thy son back unto the land from whence thou camest? And Abraham said unto him, Beware that thou bring not my son back thither. I have never been there. So um, uh, the Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my nativity, who spoke unto me and who swore unto me, saying, Until thou see I will give this land, he will send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife for my son from thence. And if the woman be not willing to follow thee, then thou shalt be clear from this oath. Only thou, only thou shalt not bring my son back thither. And the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. All right. So I just like to be brief um, in this here because it's pretty long. Uh, it's one of the longest things here. Only twice in scriptures that we read about that a man went to get a wife for this, uh, get a wife for this son. Abraham is the first. The next guy you ever read about that went to get a wife for his son, a chosen wife for his son, was Yehuda of the tribe of Judah. When he chose his wife, Tamar, for his oldest son. Now, um, not to be going over the story, I'm sure everybody heard this story, you know, throughout the various congregations um, that they travel with. But one of the things I have to bring out in reference to the story is that you have Abraham himself sending a guy for Isaac and to get a wife for Isaac. And only thing he want is just somebody from the, from the neighborhood on that side. No quality. Don't say she got to look beautiful. Don't say that uh, she served only the God of heaven and earth. Don't say what kind of attitude she's supposed to have. Don't say what's the educational level. But in a way, he's saying, okay, I, I know what the kind of criteria but people is on that side. I'm from over there. Also, that Abraham, the only woman he got from there is his wife, and she's gone. And why now did you think about Isaac when he's at this age to get a wife? And then why is it that you would deal with an Egyptian and later on you would deal with some woman, you know, some, you know, it's always a debate whether Keturah and Hagar is the same. I don't, I don't, I don't, I just don't, you know, bother with that. I just look at it as two different women. All right. You can marry and deal with who you want to deal with, but yet Ozzy had to have a specific wife, and that's it. And can't be dealing with anybody else in the land. Uh, so, and you was never prohibited from that criteria. So all those things is there. And the servant goes out, and then uh, I just like this little part here when he's um, when he goes ahead and meets at the well, and you go to meet the well, you know, who goes to meet a female at the well? If you're going to the house, you're going to the people's house. You're going to see where they live, how they live. But you sit there and look for a woman at the well. And then the servant makes a prayer to the creator on behalf of his master. There's a lot of things that's going on there. The servant makes a prayer on behalf of his master, Abraham. And talking about the God of his master. Because I don't have no real close relationship with you like that. <clears throat> but I learned about you through my master. So therefore, since I learned about you a little bit from my master, <clears throat> if you and my master are tight as y'all, because I see my master do some phenomenal stuff. So if you and him is really that tight, then this is what I'm, I'm laying out here. And he's saying this prayer in his, in his heart, like, you know, thinking it. He's not order, you know, speaking aloud about that. And then... He asked for a woman to bring, you give him some water. He asked a woman to water to drink. A bunch of women's there. And then when you see a bunch of women's there, <clears throat> you say, okay, who, how, you know, how many water, how much water are you going to drink if a bunch of women's there? Which one are you going to pick? You're going to pick one that looks good and pleasing to you physically. You know, 
but the physical character is not good enough. Now it's easy to get somebody to give you some drink of water in the East. In the West, you can't hardly use a bathroom in the West when you travel. You know, and certainly, especially if you come to a place like New York City, you go in the store, you know, uh, either you cannot use the bathroom or it's for customers only. You know, here in the East, it was more hospitable. So you say, all right, anybody going to give you something to drink? But he said, no, I need to step it up a lot more. See how hospitable she is, that you're really going to be. And he finds, he said, look, these 10 camels I got, each camel on empty drinks 25 gallons. Each camel on empty. So now that's 250 gallons. We, we don't have no, 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 you know, a sprinkler system. Let her fill the bucket up for 20 uh, of these 10 camels. And she'd be willing to do that. It's good enough to give me a drink to sustain me. I'm energetic. But now I want you to work for me without any compensation that you know of. And you draw water. And you really have to draw water for whatever flock you, you're dealing with and what you're dealing with or whatever the case you're doing. So that was phenomenal. So he gave a test, and, and, and this is going to be the mistress, his new mistress over the house. So we know how the story went. He went there. The story changed. So um, it's a lot of uh, one story how it actually happened, and the story how he narrated. It's a lot of jewels to be discussed within it. So, but one of the things I like to bring out in reference to that, you know, as we go through that story, is that you find some of the first where. You know, uh, you know that a wife is being sent for, and that she's asked a certain thing in reference to um, uh, the, the qual. You know, uh, um, she's asked. You know, the, the servant asked for a certain quality in the woman. All right. And the last thing I want to bring out in this situation, you know, it's called um, actually, because um, you know, but I always urge people to read the story what happened at the well with the servant, because it's one of the longest stories and it's one that's said, spoken up twice with some differences in it that's unique, that would stimulate a lot of conversation amongst the um, people of a, a congregation. <clears throat> and the, the very last thing is about, you find Abraham died. So you figure the life of Sarah, she died. And we know Abraham lived a lot longer after Isaac had the wife who's married at 40. So that means, Abraham was only 140. So Abraham had quite a considerable amount of years left after Rebecca was married and everything like that. We know that Isaac and Jacob, I mean, I mean Esau and Jacob was 15 years old when they fought, their grandfather Abraham died. But his life was over with when Sarah's life was over with. And one of the things we, uh, we learned that when he had his other children, he sent them away a lot better off. Well, 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 and I'm prepared. And I'm just going to finish off in this um, in this verse here, because Abraham was the first man to be called the old man in scriptures too. So that's something that's unique. That he's the first man to be called as I quaint, an old, an old man. But um, I'm going to read the 25th chapter, and I've, I'm complete with that. Um, it said in the, um, in the fifth verse, and Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac. But unto the sons of the concubines that Abraham had, Abraham gave gifts. And he sent them away from Isaac, his son, while he yet lived eastward unto the east country. And these are the days of the years of Abraham's life, which he lived a hundred and three score and fifteen years, 175. And Abraham expired. That means he had no more use and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people. And Isaac and Ishmael, his sons, buried him in the cave of Machpelah in the field of Ephron, the son of Zahar, the Hittite, which is before Mamre, the field which Abraham purchased of the children of Heth. There was Abraham buried and Sarah, his wife. And it came to pass after the death of Abraham that God blessed Isaac, his son, and Isaac dwelt by bare La high right? La high right. So now, the last I, I finished it. You know, this, it still goes on a few more verses, but 
what I want to bring out here is that imagine his life was over with. He tried to do some good. But what is key fact is that Isaac and Ishmael buried him. Can you imagine at a funeral? Because you don't read where Isaac was at his mother's funeral. But you read where Isaac was at his father's funeral. <clears throat> you read that Ishmael and Isaac got together. So they mustn't, uh, so don't Abraham sent his son Isaac, I mean Ishmael away. There must have been some kind of range of communication for Ishmael to make it to his father's funeral. And he deferred and gave Isaac, you know, the first place. Now, what's even more is, you know, intriguing with the similar conversations is that uh, people always have some regrets, memories. So can you imagine if Ishmael came to the funeral and said, wow, uh, you know, you know, um, you know, and Isaac said, well, my father, you know, I mean, Ishmael said, look, my father, man, he, was, he, he didn't treat me too well, man, but, I, you know, I respect him. I still love him, you know, but he didn't treat me too well because what he what he actually, you know, did was uh, he sent me, because uh, mind you know, Ishmael's about 17 years old. He sent me off with my mother with just bread and water. I'm 17 years old. I almost died on that little trip, but I still love my father and I'm coming back. And, and Isaac could have traded story and said, well, you thought you had it bad. He opposed being left, his only son, and he about ready to cut my throat. I didn't hear what stopped him, but I know I was satisfied that he stopped me. I didn't feel a way about it. And the next day, you know, my mother is dead. My mother is dead. So can you imagine stories being traded off like that at that particular time? And then all right, my father might have treated you bad by sending you some bread and water on, on your back. But I got all this stuff, but that wasn't a blessing. God had to bless me. My father never blessed me. So these are some things to think about as we go through the story of, uh, you know, a patriots. So I'm going to the psalm, which is a psalm, um, um, and I'm sorry it's been a little long, but you know, sometimes they double up and there's so much stuff there. Um, I'm going to the Psalm, 45th Psalm, that's related to this particular portion in the book of Kaye uh, Sarah. So, in the 46th Psalm, I'm mean 45th, 45th Psalm, I, if you did, Chief, you could begin from the first verse, 45. Psalms 45, hallelujah. Hallelujah. For the leader upon Shoshanim, a psalm of the sons of Korah, Maskil, a song of loves. All right, hold it right there. Now that's right there in there. Then let you know that this one is not David's psalm directly, but a song of the sons of Korah. You know, uh, the, 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 the father of Korah and, and them, was, you know, ran, stood against Moses and they died, but the sons survived. So the sons became you know, more devout in their service to the creator and singers. So they have the Psalms here that's attributed to them. All right, uh, let's uh, continue the second verse. Verse two, my heart overfloweth with a goodly matter. Uh -huh. I say, my work is concerning a king. My tongue uh -huh. is the pen of a ready writer. Uh -huh. Thou art fairer than the children of men. Grace uh -huh. is poured upon thy lips. Therefore, right. God hath blessed thee forever. Gird thy sword upon thy thigh, O mighty one, that thy glory and thy majesty. Yeah. And thy majesty prosper. Ride on in behalf of truth and meekness and righteousness. Let And let thy right hand teach thee tremendous things. Uh -huh. Thine arrows are sharp. The peoples fall under thee. They sink into the heart of the king's enemies. Thy throne, given of God, is forever and ever. A scepter of equity is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, thy God, have anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Hold right there, hold right there. Okay. Now, this is um, 
some people use it in reference to the Messiah, but also you can see some references to some of the treatment and the status that Abraham had, because Abraham was referred to when he was trying to purchase a king, I mean, a, a, a burial place for Sarah as, you know, you know, uh, you know, a, a, a prince, a prince of God, you know, that's why I refer to by the people. So sometimes, you know, you might feel as it's not, there's nothing wrong being a stranger, but sometimes it's bad. You know, I mean, it's, it's more often bad to be in strange. So Abraham said he was a stranger, but do, do, we, do I fit in? Because I need, I need an audience with you. So am I in strange or am I just a stranger? I know I'm an outsider, but I need certain things done for me. But here it is that Abraham was recognized of great status amongst, amongst uh, other people, not only as a prince of God, but also as a prophet. So he has status. And so they look at the, they, they refer to as the messianic period in the later time. Some people allude to these different passages here, of course, about the last days, about how the, the king of David should be recognized and represented within um, the nation and how all the nations from viewers. All right, so we can pick it up from there. Verse, verse nine. Right. It reads, Myrrh and aloes and Cassia are all thy garments. Out uh -huh. of ivory palaces, string instruments have made thee glad. Keep on. King's daughters are among thy favorites. At thy right hand doth, doth stand the queen and goal of Ophir. Keep on. Hearken, O daughter, and consider and incline thine ear. Forget also uh -huh. thine own people and thy father's house. Uh -huh. So shall the king desire thy beauty, for he is thy lord. And do homage unto him. Okay. And O daughter of Tyre, the richest of the people shall entreat thy favor with a gift. Mm -hmm. All glory is, is the king's daughter within the palace. Her raiment is of checkered work and, and wrought with gold. Hold it right there, hold it right there, hold it right there. And one of the parts of the, the portion not too long ago, uh, Sarah herself, when she was abducted by Abimelech, she was decked out well. You know, she was decked out well in the portion when she was decked by Abimelech, you know, in that, in that area. And we, re, we read um, later on, you know, um, that she was looked upon as a queen herself. But this is talking about in reference to the nation itself. But we could see a lot of correlations and we could make it, you know, uh, fit one way or the other with either story. But more so, if we stick with one area, it's about the nation itself. All right, come sheet. It reads, verse 15. 15. She shall be led unto the king on richly woven stuff, the virgins, her companions, and her train being brought unto thee. Uh -huh. They shall be led with gladness and rejoicing. They shall enter into the king's palace. Instead uh -huh. of thy fathers shall be thy sons, whom thou shalt make princes in all the land. Uh -huh. I will make thy name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore shall the peoples praise thee forever and ever. Hallelujah. I basically, if you look at the, the nations in the latter days, is that the, when they talk about the, 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 the princesses, that's like the secondary nations uh, under, 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 underneath the queen. You know what I mean? So that would be the secondary nation. The primary nation would be underneath the king itself. So when we look at the, um, the, the, the secondary nation is going to get respect and, and they're going to have a change of heart, have a change of worship. And everybody was in agreement, pretty much, will be the coalition with um, Kaya Sarah and, and this particular portion that later on in the future, we're going to come back during the Messianic era where everybody going to be praises, you know, give praises to the, the nation of Israel, respect us in our status, and also respect the God of heaven and earth. And it's in um, in the Sidra, uh, Kaya Sarah, Abraham addressed the God as the God of heaven and earth, and then later on he addressed as the God of heaven. So those are certain things that um, you might find and referenced um, in some of the correlation between this and the book of Psalms. Um, and, uh, an another fact is that when we look at the, the actual uh, detail about the greatness that not only, like I said earlier, 
that we think of Mother Sarah and the nation being great and, uh, and, and, and worthwhile, but other nations going and um, are going to think of the greatness of uh, of our patriarchs and mothers and our, you know and all our ancestors and our way of life and our God. So hopefully, hopefully you got something out of this here in reference to this. There's a lot more I could say, but being I did a double, I try to just be as brief as I can without omitting too much. Um, but I always, always advise people to study and go back over it and then, you know, elaborate on certain points that I, I omitted uh, and any mistakes with my own. And then stimulate a lot of thoughts, especially the, the interesting thing that the first guy to ever say what we would say, um, you know, uh, for most people that would say that uh, the, uh, the test of grammar time and blessed God was this unnamed sermon. We don't know the name in the sermon. It's not given in the book. It's only given in rabbinic literature. And everybody say, ah, oh, this is uh, Eliezer. That had to be the, the senior servant. That's the one they sent on a mission. Then if that's the one they sent in the mission, then his name is not important because it's not mentioned in the book. What's important is the mission. And also he's recognizing the creator when he said, you know, you know, you know you know what I mean? He's the first guy to say that. You don't find a patriot ever saying that. And the second guy to say that has a name, which is Jethro, Moses' father-in-law. Those are the only two, first two times you read that term ever used. So with that, I hope you guys saw what I said. Any mistakes have been my own. And everybody have a, um, you know, I say Shalom Lekin or early Shabbat Shalom. And um, I support the DCB channel, you know, as much as you can. And, um, you know, and uh, be a lot of great teachers to be coming out of there. So with that, I say Shalom Lekin. Right. Shalom, Shalom, Nasik. Told out for the words. Told out for the wisdom and, and the understanding. And um, see you all. Um, next week. Shalom, shalom. <laughs>